spread the fire. Welcome to SMWX. Today, we're going to have a conversation about the media and we're going to look at some examples around how the media is covering different stories and if that particular coverage helps us understand the current moment, especially in an election year. And one of the stories that I'm going to highlight is the story of Paul Mashatile, the deputy president of South Africa and the ANC, as contrasted to how the president himself and stories around, uh, you know, his farm and anything that happened at his farm have been covered. Because there's a bit of a difference, if we're honest, and we need to have a conversation about that. So, first place we can start. What is the role of the media? The media, the media, the media. What is the role of the media? What are they supposed to do? The media is supposed to provide information and entertainment to the public. In a nutshell, that's what they're there for, to provide information and entertainment to the public. The entertainment really is not a core function of our discussion here. You know, you can watch whatever you enjoy to watch on Showmax, Netflix, whatever the case may be, whatever platform. That's not really our context. The context that matters when it comes to the media is the news side of the conversation because as it provides information, as it informs the public, the media has a very powerful role in setting the agenda and the focus of the public in and when they do discuss particular topics. So let's look at an American example, which some people say had a bearing in the outcome of the last election. Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, had a laptop, and on that laptop they were compromising pictures, compromising files, you name it. And the New Yorker uh, published a story based on that particular laptop, which had been left in a particular you know, repair shop for repairs, etc., and then it ended up in the hands of the media. What happened is that media, social media platforms then took down the story of the Hunter Biden laptop. They took it down because they said that it was fake news and they got people from various government departments to create a narrative saying that the Hunter Biden laptop story was not real. After the election and after further investigation, it turned out actually that the Hunter Biden laptop story was real, the contents of the laptop were real, and they were very, very damaging in how they portrayed Hunter Biden in particular, and by proxy, his father. And there's a lot of speculation around how much his father was involved in his dealings, the son's dealings, and the argument as it pertains to the last election is that they could have been a material difference in voter turnout or in electoral outcomes if that story had not been suppressed. And some people who are supporters of Donald Trump argue that the suppression of that particular story actually cost Donald Trump some votes. I don't really want to make a determination on that here and give you my view because that's not relevant or material to the conversation. This example serves to illustrate that the media can have impact on electoral outcomes. So that's the Hunter Biden laptop story. That's America. Let's look at a more local story. For a very long time, publications ran a story that the economic freedom fighters were VBS looters, that the VBS mutual bank, which collapsed in Limpopo after the bank officials and you know accounting firms and a variety of other entities basically used the bank's funds and the funds of people in municipalities as a piggy bank. They bought themselves helicopters. They lived the most lavish lives. The argumentation and the narrative that came from the media with multiple stories week after week after week after week was that the EFF were VBS looters. As time progressed, the National Prosecuting Authority started to prosecute people and people were charged. No members of the EFF were charged with the crime or fraud or any of the various laws which were broken in the looting of the VBS bank. 
In fact, even when one of the people turned state witness, with the first guy who actually turned state witness and testified against the other guys who was serving his time in prison, no one implicated the EFF or any of its leaders in criminal actions. Now, there are some debates and disputes about the morality or the ethics of certain decisions taken by relatives of members of the EFF and whether or not they should have taken some money or other monies. But the fundamental point remains, as things stand right now, the people who have been prosecuted for the crime of fraud and other related crimes in relation to the collapse of VBS Mutual Bank are actually not in any way connected with the EFF. If they are connected to a political party at all, all roads lead to the governing party which governs Limpopo province and the nation. So if you spoke to somebody who did not follow the story in detail or blow by blow and say to them, who looted VBS Bank? The answer would be the economic freedom fighters. But objectively, at a dissection level, there are no microscopic details that show that the economic freedom fighters were involved in that. And recently, one of the big accounting firms, KPMG, paid a settlement of 500 million rands for their involvement in the VBS mutual bank scandal because they didn't do the auditing the way that they were supposed to do. I don't know what it is about KPMG, but whenever there's a scandal... KPMG is around the corner because this is not the first time that they've been implicated in this particular issue. And it is fair and appropriate for us to say this because they have paid settlements in both of those instances. This is a matter of public record. So at the point at which KPMG has settled 500 million rands for their role, at the point at which you have people who are facing trial and are charged because the National Prosecuting Authority believes they have a credible case for conviction for these particular people. Is it credible for us to then make a conclusion that the economic freedom fighters were involved? Forget what you feel about Julius Malema. Forget what you think about Floyd Shivambo. Forget what you think about Dubuli Pony and everything that is happening in the political climate. Just on the facts, is there a credible case? I would venture that there is not a credible case and that the media had a mismatch in what they covered and what cumulatively happened within the VBS scandal, uh, actual trial and case in, in and of itself. The narrative versus the reality had a big gap and it affected perceptions of this one particular political party. Thanks for watching SMWX. Before we get back to the episode, I just wanted to let you know the four ways that you can help support this channel if you want to see us growing bigger and better to keep you more entertained and informed. The first way is you can invite me to speak at your company, your school, your institution. You'll see the contact details down below. The second way is that you can become a member of this channel. Become a member or you can give us a thanks. You'll see there's like a heart with a dollar sign in the ribbon below this video. Buy me and the team some coffee for this episode. The third way you can get involved is you can advertise on the channel. Now, I'd much rather the community of viewers would be advertisers on this channel than me going out to people who don't really know about SMWX and trying to explain it to them. So if you're a viewer and you have a business and you want to partner and you love this platform, let's partner on this channel. And then finally, you can buy merchandise, you can buy books. All this is in the description down below. Now let's get back to the episode. Now, let's go to the main event, the discussion around Paul Mashatile. In the last year, I have learned a lot about Paul Mashatile, against my will sometimes. I have learned who his girlfriends are or his alleged girlfriends. I have learned about his properties. I have learned more about him in the last 365 days than in any period of time preceding this. Of course, he became the deputy president of the ANC and the deputy president of South Africa, so he warrants scrutiny. And I am seeing a level of scrutiny, charts, graphs, spider web thingies. You know the spider, once the spider web thingies show up, you know that the media is very interested because they don't want to just explain you. They want to show the spider web. This side, cousin. This side, girlfriend. This side is the son. This side is the dogolosh. This side is the coco. This side is the dog that was barking next door. This is where he lives over here. This. It's a lot. But 
it is fair to cover that. The only challenge that exists in our media landscape is that they don't equally cover every scandal. The media, when it came to digital vibes, Zulim Kiza, you remember that scandal? Oh, we found out everything. This is Zulim Kiza's cousin. This is Zulim Kiza's child. This is where they do this thing. This is where they do that thing. Uh, these are their good friends, associates. Sha, sha, sha. Here's the chat. Here's the graph. Here's the bank statement. Here's the bank statement. Here's the... <laughs> we got everything. But ask yourself, Arthur Fraser goes to the police station on, I think it was the 1st of June, 2022. He says, listen, I know for a fact that millions of US dollars were stolen from President Ramaphosa's farm from where he was hiding them in his sofas and his mattress. I know for a fact because they came to me and tried to get me to help them to get this money back. I know that people were sent into Namibia. They went into Namibia to investigate and try to recover this money from these particular people. And they may have been multiple violations of international law and domestic law to try to get that money back. I know that for a fact. His spokesperson gets interviewed in the media. They say, did, did this happen? Yeah, no, the money was stolen. We didn't tell the community because we didn't want the community to be afraid. We didn't report the case because, you know, we're dealing with it internally and we told the police person within the presidency, so it's fine. Don't worry. And then the story goes, the story goes, the story goes. The media seems not to be as interested. I have seen Paul Mashatile unmasked. I've not really seen Palapala unmasked in terms of coverage of that particular scandal. I've not even seen follow-ups on really what was happening with the sun and the Bosasa money and anything happening there. If you say it is worthwhile to know what Paul Mashatile's son is doing and any corrupt dealings he may be involved in, if you say it is fair for us to ask questions about everything that is happening within the network of influence of Paul Mashatile, Surely it is fair for us to get the same level of coverage for the president because he's currently the head of state. He's at the front of the ticket. He's going to be the number one candidate for the ANC. And if they can cobble together a majority, he will be governing. So what about his relationships? What about the source of that money? We've gotten some ideas, but we've never gotten a full picture. We've never gotten from the media the same level of scrutiny, analysis, charts, Bar graphs, spider web thingies, you name it. We've not gotten that. Podcasts, we haven't gotten a themed episode, unmasked, so and so. Maybe that's out of respect, but also maybe it's because the media is playing a role in influencing public perception in a way that we should examine, question, and scrutinize because we've already established that the media can actually affect electoral outcomes. And if the media is going to cover these types of stories, they have to be fair, they have to be comprehensive, and they have to be consistent. What does that mean? It means if you care about digital vibes, you must also care about the unfair treatment of black people by banks, by insurance companies. There have been enough anecdotal stories from people who've had negative experiences for us to actually say there's something worth investigating here by the media, but the media seems to have favorites, the dominant media. They choose which companies are worthy of scrutiny and which companies are worthy of exemption. They choose which individuals are worthy of the harsh treatment of the eye of the media and which people are not worthy of that. And that distorts, that distorts the public understanding, one, of the issues, and two, of the kinds of decisions that they have to make. In a democracy, those who govern, govern with the consent of the majority. The process of transferring that consent is known as a vote, right? That's how you transfer consent. Now, consider this. If the media does not do its duty in informing the public comprehensively, consistently, accurately about all of the relevant players who they are considering to transfer power to, to be their elected representatives, to make laws, to hold each other accountable, does that not distort the quality of the democracy? Does that not distort the decision-making? In order for a decision to be a well-made decision, it needs to be made 
with full information, with full rationality. And that's where the role of the media becomes so critical. But if the media cannot do that, or if the media is not doing that, I think that everyone is justified to ask the question, why not? Is it then warranted for people to then look at who owns these particular media houses? Whose interests do the owners prefer? Or what interests do the owners have of these particular media houses in various other businesses that they may share in? Because in an oligopoly economy of which South Africa is, the people who own the media also own big businesses. And those big businesses sometimes do not want the level of scrutiny which they should be getting from the media. And we have to ask ourselves, in those instances, is the media solving its problem? So, or solving its role, or performing its role, rather, to the public. So, I want to conclude and say, how do we fix this? How do we fix this particular problem of a selective media? How do we fix the problem of a media that is not serving its role? I think that we disrupt. I think that we disrupt. How do you do that? It's platforms such as these. SMWX. It's a great platform because it allows academics, scholars, thinkers, analysts, commentators to come on and have a conversation about the political moment, the economic moment, the cultural moment in South Africa and even on the continent. So if you haven't yet, right, you need to click the ting, click the ting, like the video, subscribe, put a comment in the replies because that helps other people find the channel. And that's how you disrupt what is happening in mainstream media is by supporting platforms such as these platforms and making sure that other people can find the platform. And we know we've looked at the analytics that not everyone watching this video right now is subscribed. So just click the thing. Let's get moving. Let's provide alternative platforms. There are other platforms. You know, there's a lot of podcasts out here in the YouTube world and the podcast universe, but not everyone is saying things that are sensible. You listen to some of these cats. One day it's this thing. Next week it's another thing. You even ask yourself, besides getting clicks, really, what is happening in this podcast economy? I think this podcast... This project is one of the most fact-based, one of the most intellectual, one of the most robust in trying to actually provide information to the audience. And that's one of the ways that we disrupt. The other way is that we have to use social media to challenge these platforms when and if they go off topic or when they try to ignore things. So if the competition commission is alleging that the rand has been manipulated, the media cannot be last to the party. And they were last to the party last year. And we know that this story is back in circulation now because the Competition Commission has actually said, we are going to the Constitutional Court because we still think that many banks participated in the manipulation of the RAND. And by the way, they said that that manipulation was at the detriment of the RAND. And we know that some banks have already admitted guilt. Some have paid fines in international markets in relation to the U.S. RAND thing. So social media can counteract the agenda-setting uh, power of mainstream media because everyone eventually will show up on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook to have these conversations. So if you feel like the media is not covering a topic well enough, challenge them. Raise those issues on social media. Use your own platforms to challenge and provoke uh, mainstream around these particular issues. That's one of the ways that we start fixing this. The other way that I think we can course correct is we need to read more. We need to read more. You know, the legend once said, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. None but ourselves. So how do you do this? You watch these podcasts, but you got to read. You got to read books that are relevant to the economic moment in South Africa and the world. It's important for us to do this because we cannot be operating without fundamental understanding of all of the things that are, ha are happening. So this is one of the platforms where we promote reading. These books are not, <laughs> this, this is not just a, <laughs> Caesar has written books. This is not a decoration PhD that he has. He has tried to make sure that the platforms have information and that information has a theoretical background, a well-researched background. We need to do more of that. We are not going to be able to have honest conversations about the political moment unless and until we also are an educated audience. That's how we begin to counteract 
the narratives that sometimes may be unfair, biased, or whatever. But I want to just do a last comment and conclude. My thinking around why the media is so focused on attacking Paul Mashatile is because they want to help Cyril. Because if he looks attractive, and he can't look attractive right now by himself because he's done a lot of state of the nation addresses. A lot has not happened. Load shedding is still bad. Everything is still in a mess. So what do you do if the main actor on the stage doesn't look that great? You have to make someone look worse, especially if that person who looks worse is supposed to come in after him or is a credible alternative to him. You have to start chopping away at his credibility. You have to start chopping away at his reputation. And this is what seems to be happening. It's that kind of a repetitive message which seeks to say to people, you may not like this particular option, but he is better than all of the alternatives. It's, it's a pessimistic marketing play because it says our guy has nothing to offer anymore, but everyone else is worse. I often worry when I see politicians and people who are in uh, public relations around politicians, even if it's mainstream media, having nothing to offer except fear. Where is the hope? Where is the hope? Where is the vision? Because if you don't have vision, if you don't have hope, you are literally saying to people, the car is crashing, but the best way for us to crash is not to get out of the car, but to choose this particular driver because he won't crash like these other guys will crash. That's not something that is appealing. Someone who's in a crashing car wants to live they want to get out of the crash situation. They don't want to crash with the least worst driver in the car. So I find it to be a sad state of affairs that if the agenda is that we just have to make everyone else look bad to help this man win, then that says that there is really no hope under that particular man, in my opinion. What do you think? Let's have a conversation. Aye, aye, aye.